like I told you, we're going to start doing this. We were going to put the text number on your notes. Is it on there? Okay, I forgot. So on the screen, you see that text number? If you've got a pen, you can write it down. It's the only time it's going to be up here, so if you want it, write it down. That's the text number that you, if you have a question, you can text that to us this evening. So uh, just as long as you get that and understand it. So we'll leave it up there for just, now no, it's gone. You're done. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to look at Second Peter. We, we just finished First Peter. We're going to go into Second Peter tonight. Now, let me just kind of give you a little history, a little background so that you understand everything. First Peter was written to the Jewish Christians. They were going through a hard time. They were being persecuted. They were being chased out of town. They were being whooped. They were being fed to the lions. They were just had a horrible time, and Peter writes to them to try and help them get through this time. Fast forward about, let's say about six years or so, Peter writes again. Because there's something that goes on in the church that is not new, although we think it is, but it's been going on forever. Because what's happened, Peter right in First Peter wrote this great advice to them, told them what to do, how to do it. But how many of you understand whenever the good goes in, the evil comes in too? And so what has started to happen with these people is there's rising up other quote-unquote teachers, people saying, no, this is how it works. No, this is what you do. No, this is what is right. And Peter has to write again and set things straight because bad doctrine has gotten in. Still happens today, doesn't it? And so don't think it's new. Don't, oh, the church is horrible. No, no, no. It's been going on from the beginning of time. And so that's why this letter is written. Now, we're going to look at just a, I got 1 through 11. We're not going to make it through 11 tonight. I'll guarantee you that. But he, he uses some phrases over and over, and there's, it's a basis. This is the foundation. This is the kindergarten stuff that all of you should know. And that's what we're going to look at tonight. And so it begins with our precious faith. That's where he wants to start with this, and so there's a big heading, and that's what we're going to look at tonight, this subject of faith and how great it is and how precious it is. He begins with this faith comes from a person. It's a precious faith. It comes from a person. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. This is a letter from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. In other words, we're all the same faith for all of us. Notice, this faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. He gave it to us because he's just, he's fair. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus, our Lord. Now, that word knowledge is a big word in Second Peter. It's going to come up many times, and we're going to look at it. So it's important about understanding what this means. The Scriptures tell us that our faith depends on Jesus from start to finish. He's the author of our faith. He's the beginning of our faith. And Peter says we all have this same precious faith. And that faith is there. And so the major emphasis is, here's the faith, and in order for you to have faith, you're going to have to have knowledge. You have to know God. Now, we use that term know in a lot of different ways. How many of you understand, I can tell you, I know Pastor Steve. And I do. But how many of you understand that if I tell you, I know my wife, there's a different level of knowledge there, isn't there? I hope so, right? It's just different. Well, I know you. I can say I know a lot of people, but there's some people I know better than others. As a Christian, you should know God better than anyone else. Grow in knowledge. You should know him. You, well, I know about God. No, that's not enough. You should know God. You should know his character. You should understand his ways. And so Peter writes this and says, I want you to grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. 
I want you to grow in that knowledge. Now, that's not a new concept. In fact, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul writes to us and says, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I want to know Christ. I want to know him. Our lives should be spent as Christians dedicating ourselves to knowing God. How do you know God? Through his word. You know his word, you know God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You want to know what God's like? Read the life of Jesus. He'll show you that. Look at Colossians chapter 3 verse 10. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. The more you know God, the better you know God, the more like him you become. Because you know him. 1 John 3, 1. I think sometimes we read this verse and we kind of apply it in a place that it probably applies to, but it also applies here. See how much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that's what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know him. You know what? Have you ever talked to some of your friends and they start telling you what God's like and you're thinking, I don't know about that God you're talking about because that isn't the God that I know, right? They have a completely warped idea of God and what he's like. Dear friends, we're already God's children, but he's not yet shown us what we'll be like when Christ appears. But we know that we'll be like him for we will see him as he is. And all who want to have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to God's law. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins, and there is no sin in him. And anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. If you want to become better at defeating the sin that you struggle with, One of the keys is knowing God better. The more you know him, the more likely you are to be able to stand against your nature that comes out at times. And so all this time we come to that place where he talks about this faith. And how does that faith come about? How do you get more faith? You know God better. The more you know him, the more you trust him. The more you put faith in him. And so Peter writes out, to these people at the very beginning. He just says, I want you to grow in grace and peace, but in order for that to happen, you're going to have to grow in your knowledge of God. All right? Secondly, this faith gives us his power. Gives us his power. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. By his divine power. God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. That's a pretty incredible statement. That right now you don't lack anything. That God has offered to you everything that you need to live for him. Do we believe that? You better. We've received all of this by coming to know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. He gives us everything we need. So Peter writes, these people struggling, going through difficulties, being torn by wrong teaching and bad theology. And he says, look, 
You don't get sidetracked here. You have to know God. Because you and I, in the last days, what does it tell us? People will fall away. Lovers of selves, more than lovers of pleasure. What will happen in the last days? More and more people rise up to tell us what God's like and they don't know. You have to know him. When you know him, you can put your faith in him, and that gives you power. And the more you know God, the more power you have, and the more likely you are to be able to live for him. So faith is tied to a knowledge of knowing God, and out of that comes a power of living for God. Oh, God, please help me. God says, I've given you everything you need to get through this. God, I'm really going through a hard time now. Would you please help? I've given you everything you need to get through this. But God, I just, I've given you everything you need to get through this. That's what he's saying, right? And sometimes we think, oh, there must be something missing. There's nothing missing. God has done everything for us to give us everything that we need so that we can live a godly life. And I've said this to you before, let me just say it again. God never asks you to do anything you can't do. God says, I'll give you this. It's there. You have it. I provided it. Romans 1.19. They know the truth about God because it's been made obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky, and through everything God has made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Romans 8, therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. If you live by its dictates, you're going to die. You're not going to have a life worth living. If you just follow your own nature and do what you want, what feels right, what comes naturally, it leads to death. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Do you understand that when Jesus Christ left, he said, I need to go away so that another can come, so that he can live in you and help you live the life you need to live. And God says, I've given everything you need, all the power you need to live for me, and that power comes through the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. He's in us, alive in us. That power is resident in us. He's there to help us. He's there to say, you can do this. You can live like this. Ephesians 1, chapter, verse 19. I also pray that you'll understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly places. In other words, the same power of the Spirit that's in me today is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. That's pretty strong. So that power is available to us, in us, so that you and I can live a godly life. Now, the thing is, do you believe it? Faith says, I believe this is true. How do I believe that? Because God said it. And therefore, I have the power to live for God. No excuses, but you don't understand how hard this is. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand everything. I don't. But God says, look, I have given you everything you need to live a godly life. Do you believe in me? Will you put your faith in me? Will you get to know me more? By the way, Knowing God means you've got to know the Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God. So he's alive in us. Ephesians 3.20. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. I hope you're just getting blown away. Oh, wow, this is all in me, alive in me. 
that power's there, this is available to me? Yes, it is. God does not leave you powerless. Jesus said, after I go, you shall receive power. So we have power. We just don't tap into it. But here's the real problem. We don't know God well enough. We don't know how great he is. We don't know how much he loves us. We don't know how powerful he is in us. And our faith is weakened because we don't know that. You can't put your faith in someone you don't know. We got any questions? Yeah, just one. Can the Holy Spirit leave us? Um, yes. I like a better way to say it, though, than him just leaving us. It's not like he's walking out the door, see you later and goodbye. You and I have to understand, we have to invite him in. And if we invite him in, he'll come and live in us. But we also, and I'll use this term, it's not real couth, but I'll use it, we also can kick him out. You know, hey, I don't want to listen to you anymore. You don't have to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, he's there. He wants to help you. He'll talk with you, but you have to listen to him. So he's not going to just walk out on you. He will always be there as long as you have invited him and recognize his presence. All right. Now, this gets even better. This faith is built, this faith gives us his promises. It gives us his promises. 2 Peter 1, verse 4. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So God says, look, I will give you the ability to put your faith in me, and as you know me and get to know me better, your faith can grow in me, and I will give you all the power that you need, and you can bank your faith on it because I'm promising you this is how it's going to work. Faith is built on God's promises. Now, you don't get to make these up. And here's what we want to do. Well, I'm just going to claim this. Claim it all you want. That doesn't make it a promise of God. Okay? You have to understand God has made promises to us. And we hold on to them. And those promises is what builds our faith. We can put our faith in God. In fact, let me just tell you something. You know there's something better than you at night laying your head down on the pillow and worrying? Psalmist wrote this, I stay awake through the night thinking about your promises. Wow. Do you know God's made a lot of promises to you? To us? And I can bank my faith on God's promises. In fact, much of faith is believing God's promises. I believe God and what he says. Notice what it says about Abraham. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. Abraham never questioned God's promise. Now, he got a little impatient with it. It didn't happen as fast as he wanted it to happen, but he always believed God was going to do it. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this, he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. Fully convinced. That's called faith. I believe God will keep his promise. I believe God will do everything he's promised he's going to do. 
2 Corinthians one twenty one. It is God who enables us along with you to stand firm for Christ. In other words, live the life. He has commissioned us and he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts. As the first installment that guarantees everything he promised us. He promised to send the Holy Spirit, and that's his guarantee that everything else I promised to you, I'm going to do it. I will keep my word. I'll do it. Well, but pastor, are you sure God's still that way? 2 Corinthians 7, one. because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit, and let us work towards complete holiness because we fear God. We know God's going to do this. Hebrews, God also bound himself with an oath so that those who received the promise could be perfectly sure that he would never change his mind. Now, if you're sitting there, well, what about this time? What about this time? What about this time? You don't know God very well if that's where your mind's at right now. You just don't know him. I know that's blunt, but it's a fact. So God has given us both his promise and his oath. And these two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have confidence, faith, as we hold to the hope that lies before us, this hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Wow. Now, a few little verses. Peter begins. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to know that you can have your faith in God. And that faith will grow as you know him better and better. And as you grow in your knowledge of him, you will have more power to live for him. And that power will help you be the person that God wants you to be and help you to deal with the issues in your life. And you can live in that power because God has promised that he won't fail you or forsake you. He's promised that I'll take care of you. He's promised there'll never be anything you can go through but what you won't be able to escape. He's promised that he's going to work everything out for good. He's promised those things. And you see, when you and I struggle is when we begin to doubt the promises of God. When our faith gets weak, it's because we're doubting God's promises. We're doubting God's power that's alive in us and working in us. And why do we doubt? We go back to the beginning. We don't know God very well. And Paul writes, I want to know him. I want to know him. Because when I get to know him better and better and better, my faith grows. And I get to live in the power of God. And I can hold on to the promises of God. Because every word he's spoken will come true. He can be trusted to keep his promises. And you and I get to live in that. Wow. I can live for God. I can do what God wants me to do. Not my own strength. Not my own might. Well, pastor, I need to say this prayer. Are you sure I can do this? We got all these questions about that. Get to know God better. The more you know him, the stronger you'll be in him. The more you'll trust him, the greater your faith will be the bigger his promises become to you and the more power you will have. So this week, get to know God a little bit better because that answers a lot of our questions, doesn't it? Because God can't lie and God cares and you and I can trust him, can't we? Father, tonight, I pray that you will help us to know you better. 
just as Peter writes to these people who are being tossed about by different doctrine and being challenged by different struggles in life. He points them in the direction to put their faith in God. And as they get to know him, their faith can grow. And Lord, we thank you tonight for the promises that you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, that the power of God is alive in us. And we thank you that we have everything we need to live for you. So, Lord, we go from this place tonight to do just that, to live by our faith and to live for you and to honor you in every way. In thy name we pray. And everybody said, amen. God bless you as you go.